Hello everybody and welcome to Daily Bread episode one. It's our very first time together and uh, I am excited for this. I think that, um, I guess I should say I hope that this time can be a time of growth with us together and um, especially during this time where I don't get to see you guys on a regular basis and um, teach you like I normally would on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. Uh, I know we still have our teaching on our Wednesday night when we go live each week, but I thought this could be a little bit more intimate setting and also uh, maybe a time, a chance for you to go a little bit deeper into scripture. Um, I know for a fact, because I've talked to many of you, um, that devotions can be a struggle and getting into our word daily can be a struggle and it's not easy. And I know that many of you desire that and you want that. Um, but for whatever reason, even in these times of quarantine, when we have all this extra time, it seems, uh, we still can't seem to find time to do that uh, often. And so um, I know that's not everybody. Some of you are doing great with that. Um, but for those of you that really need it and need that reminder, need that help along this way, I'm hoping that this can serve that purpose. And for those of you that are already doing well um, and you're opening the word and you're digging into it, then maybe this can just be a bonus for you if you choose to enter into this. But I just thought we could go through some books of the Bible. Today we're going to start with Ecclesiastes, and uh, we'll go through it, all 12 chapters, um, just doing a chapter a day, and then after that uh, we'll move on to a different book. But I um, thought that we could read it and talk about it at the same time, and kind of use this as a, a time of intentional study, um, and uh, maybe even answering some questions or going deeper um, as well. So. Um, let me just open us with a word of prayer today, and then we'll dig into chapter one of Ecclesiastes. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for these people that are choosing to watch this and choosing to enter into this time. And so I just pray that you would bless it, God. Uh, we know that um, all we can do is plant the seed, and then it's up to you to grow that. And so, God, may we plant the seed of your word in our, in our life today um, and allow you to use that and bless that and grow that, God. We love you. Amen. So let's enter into this time. As we open the book of Ecclesiastes, I wanted to kind of intro it today, being our first week together, um, or our first day together, excuse me. Um, and so I think it's important to figure out a little bit of the context and who wrote it, right? Um, as I studied this book a little bit, um, it's funny, I have a, a study Bible um, before me, right? It's down here, I know you can't see it. Um, but in my study Bible, it is... Um, already decided and come to the conclusion that King Solomon was the author of this. As I did more studying on my own, I found that the author is a little bit anonymous. It's not really 100% sure if it was Solomon, um, but at the same time, um, there's some key language that I want us to understand that I think will unfold that a little bit more. So if you would open to chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes. And you'll notice in the first sentence, it says, These are the words of the teacher, King David's son, who ruled in Jerusalem. Okay, so that's why um, immediate thought is, okay, so Solomon, right? It's also what we call a wisdom book. And um, King Solomon was known as the wisest man to ever walk the earth, right? God gave him wisdom. He asked for wisdom, and, and God gave him that. And... Um, in unfolding this wisdom book of Ecclesiastes, we're going to see that there's a lot of different elements, a lot of different parts that um, are going to hopefully get you to contemplate life a little bit. Not in the sense of should I live or should I die, but what are you doing with your life? Um, oftentimes, I know we can read scripture and we can open up the word and we can hear stories that maybe you've either heard or you haven't heard either way. Um, and we just don't, for whatever reason, let it sink in. We read it because oftentimes maybe we're trying to check it off of our list. Like, okay, I read the Bible today. I feel like a better Christian, right? Today I'm, I'm an A-plus Christian. Pat yourself on the back and then move on with your day. Um, but I think when we open the word, like, we should meditate on that word a little bit. And as we read it, break it down and, and understand it more. And that's why one of the reasons I, I enjoy having a study Bible, I don't know what you guys use to read the word, whether it's on your phone um, but there's so many different resources out there. And so I want to challenge you, as you read the Word, don't just read it and take it at, at, at face value, but, but understand it, break it down, um, get to know it on a deeper level. So back to this first um, verse 
These are the words of the teacher, King David's son, who ruled in Jerusalem. The word, the Hebrew word for teacher, which, which was the first translation that this was written in, right? The Hebrew word was actually Kohelet, right? And so everyone say Kohelet, right? Fun word. So Kohelet meant one who gathers people together. Now, typically, you would gather people together because you wanted to teach them something, right? You would gather people around, say, listen to this, I have a word for you. And so that's where this idea of, of teacher comes from. Okay, and then when you go to the second part, King David's son, um, that son of David language could be King Solomon, okay? I'm not sitting here saying Solomon did not write Ecclesiastes. Uh, it's, it's probable that it was him, but there's a couple other uh, explanations. Uh, another one that people have come up with is another descendant of David. Could have been uh, another, quote, son of David. And then the third one that people have come up with is uh, a possible later Israelite teacher who used the Solomon-like persona to teach. Like I said before, Solomon was a very wise man. As he taught, as he spoke, people listened, right? And so it could have been somebody later that was um, taking on this persona of this wise teacher, gathering people to listen. Here's why I tell you that. It doesn't change the words we're about to read, right? Regardless of who the author was, it doesn't change it. But I want us to look at this overall book. Again, not just reading it to take it at face value, but to take it on a deeper level. The teacher of this book, the teacher, the Kohelet that I told you about in verse 1, when it says, these are the words of the teacher. The teacher is a character within this book. Okay, so hear that for a second. There's two different people we're going to talk about here. The teacher, who's a character in this book that's going to be talking through the ideas of the wisdom that this book has to offer. But then the second part is the author. And the author is somebody who wants you to hear all that's within the book, but then process it and form your own conclusion about it. So we're talking about two different people here in this first verse, and I really want you to catch that. That's a deeper sense of understanding than you'd probably ever have. Most of us, if we started reason, reading Ecclesiastes, we'd read straight through that and wouldn't even think twice about it. So as we open this, these are the words of the teacher, King David's son who ruled in Jerusalem. We have an author and we have a teacher. The author is going to kind of summarize this book in chapter 1 and then again at the conclusion in chapter 12. And everything in between there is this teacher walking us through this. Okay? So, uh, again, the idea of this book is there's going to be a lot that's thrown out you, right? And, and you need to take it. You need to, to think on it, to process it, and then form your own conclusion of what it means to you. Again, this is a wise teacher speaking, sharing. This is what I've gained from my life experience. This is what I've learned. This is what I see now. And he's trying to share that with people so they don't have to walk a bad road to find it. How have you found God in your life? I want you to think about that for a second. Are you the kid that was raised in church your whole life? Didn't really have any crazy story, right? You didn't, you didn't get lost in drugs and, and live on the street and, and somebody found you and just changed your life drastically. Were you the one that, that was raised in church that found God? Or maybe you do have that drastic story. Maybe you were living a life of complete sin and, and something or someone came along the way and you found Jesus, you found the power of the Holy Spirit, and, and God transformed your life, right? I don't believe that one of those is better than the other, but both of you share different life experience. And I'm one of those kids that was raised in the church. I'm one of those that doesn't have this crazy exotic story of all this crazy stuff that happened in order for me to find God. But that doesn't mean that my story is any less meaningful than somebody else because I find my purpose and how to live that out. And so this book, as we read it, could have different meaning to each and every one of us because we're all seeing it through a different lens. And we're all seeing it through the lens that we've come from, through the lens that we've learned from, right? Maybe as we've gotten older and we've, we've studied more, you've had great teachers in your life that have gotten you to question things and, and look at things differently. Maybe now you're seeing it through a more independent lens than maybe what your parents raised you on or whatever, right? There's so many different lenses that we can come from. And so again, the idea of this book is that there wouldn't just be one point that Pastor Mike reads and then says, okay, this is how it is, but this is us contemplating the purpose of life, the purpose of all the things that we do, and you coming to the conclusion of what's it for? What's the reason? We're gonna hear about the wise person, the wise teacher's reason, and the author setting up this stage of the story for us, but then it's up to you to figure out what that means 
and how you apply that to your own life. So we enter into verse two here, right? We've talked enough about verse one for today. So we move into verse two. See, my, my little subtitle says, everything is meaningless. Isn't that such an encouraging word today as we open the word? Everything is meaningless, right? It says, everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. Now, back to the Hebrew, how this was first written. That word that in the English language that translated um, that Hebrew original word was hevel. Everyone say hevel. That's kind of a cool word, hevel, hevel. So loosely translated into English, hevel has been translated over the years into this idea of being meaningless. But at the core of the word hevel was this idea of vapor, this word smoke. And I want you to think about vapor and smoke for a second. Visualize that. Last time you saw smoke, it's kind of a paradox, right? Because as you see it, it seems as if it's something that's thick enough that's dense enough for you to reach out and grab. But if you're ever to do that with smoke, what does your hand do? It just goes straight through it, right? And so this idea, whenever you hear the word meaningless, right? It, it, meaningless, everything is meaningless, completely meaningless, says verse two. He's talking about this smoke and this idea of hevel, this, this word, this Hebrew word hevel, is actually used 38 times throughout this book. And this book's only 12 chapters long, right? It's not a crazy long book, but 38 times this has been used. And so we're going to see this concept coming back. And I want you to think about it in two different ways. First of all, number one, it's temporary, right? Vapor, smoke, it's here one day, it's gone the next. Or you could even say smaller than that. It's here one minute, gone the next, right? And then number two is that it is this paradox. It's this weird understanding that, man, even though it seems so good, so something I can grasp onto, it's gone. And it just doesn't always seem to make sense. And that's kind of what the author is going to use to summarize this book about talking about life this way. See, the author's goal in this book is to target all of the ways that we try to find meaning and purpose apart from God. And then he lets the teacher break it down and deconstruct these thoughts through the book. So again, the author is laying this out here and saying, listen, life, it sometimes seems like this great, beautiful, meaningful, great thing, right? And what I'm talking about is the things in life apart from God, right? Not beautiful because you found God, not beautiful because you have a relationship with him, but the things of life, your job, your school, your friends, your relationships, right? They can all seem so great at times, so fulfilling, but then they can so easily let us down. They can so easily break our heart. They can so easily break down our emotions, right? And we find ourselves saying, what is the meaning of this, right? It's, it's hevel. It's hevel. It's this smoke. It's this vapor that's here one minute and gone the next. And so chapter one right now is going to speak through this object of time and this concept that time, even though we're all given however much time we're given on earth, and we don't know how much that is, right? But this time, this life as we know it, we're given that. And we don't know, just like vapor and smoke, when it will be gone. And so is it truly meaningless? Let's read and find out. So let's start at verse 2 again. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. Verse 3, what do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run to the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again and the rivers, I mean, to the river, excuse me, and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here is something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. Think about that for a second. Think about those words. Why, are, why, are, why is this teacher talking like this, right? He kind of seems like a downer. Now, most of the book, the majority of the book is going to be written this way, in this thought of, listen, 
I've learned this. I've gained this through wisdom, right? What is wisdom? Wisdom is knowledge through experience, right? You gain wisdom when you experience something. So it's not just saying, it's not just book knowledge. I read this somewhere so I know it. But wisdom is when we truly experience and we find out for ourselves the meaning of that knowledge that we once had and that we once learned. And so he's talking about all of these things, generations come, generations go, sun rises, sun sets, all of these things. One way that I heard this described was, was we could have this great successful life, right? But when we come and when we go, once our life comes to an end, regardless of what we accomplished or what we did or how great we built ourselves up to feel about ourselves, guess what? Tomorrow's still gonna come and the next day's gonna come and the mountains which are here, right? They're still going to be here. And guess what? Those mountains could care less about who you are and about what you've accomplished, right? And that sounds so dim. It sounds so dark, but it's not. It's, it's this understanding that this life as we know it, life by itself, and we're going to move into the understanding as the chapters go along about life with Christ and how that should define us. The overarching idea with all of this is what are you letting define yourself? What are you letting ruin your mind? What are you letting control your mind and maybe consume you so much so that it brings about worry and fear and anxiety and hurt? All of these things that really are maybe hevel, this vapor, this smoke, meaningless as our translation says. Let's continue on. Verse 12. This is called the futility of wisdom. I, the teacher, was king of Israel and I lived in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under heaven. I soon discovered that God has dealt a tragic existence to the human race. I observed everything going under the sun, and really, it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. Imagine that for a second, chasing after the wind. Right? I heard it said that I don't see the wind, I see the effects of the wind, but nobody can see the wind. Imagine chasing after the wind. That may seem stupid and silly to see, right? Just I'm visualizing myself out in my front yard right now chasing wind and my neighbors looking out of their windows saying, what in the world is wrong with that crazy freak, right? But, but the reality is that that's life so often, right? We chase after these things. We chase after popularity. We chase after relationships. We chase after these things that we think will fulfill us, that we want to fulfill us if we're honest, right? Because we see it around us, we see it on TV, we see it in the magazines, we see it on social media. All of these things that seem to fulfill people, but it's just, it's just what you see. It's a picture, it's a snapshot, right? It's not the reality. It's meaningless, it's hevel, it's a smoke, this vapor, like chasing after the wind. Verse 15 says, what is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. I said to myself, look, I am wiser than any of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem before. I have greater wisdom and knowledge than any of them. So I set out to learn everything from wisdom to madness and folly. But I learned firsthand that pursuing all this is like chasing the wind. There's that idea again, of chasing the wind, something that you'll never be able to grasp, yet we still run after it like a crazy person. Verse 18 says, the greater my wisdom, the greater my grief. To increase knowledge only increases sorrow. What does that mean? The greater my wisdom, the greater my grief. Now again, go back to our understanding and definition of wisdom. How do we understand wisdom? As, as knowledge with experience. So the more that we experience, the more hurt we feel. The more joy you may feel. The more um, grief you may feel come to understand. See, the more you know about an issue, the more details you have. Sometimes those details aren't pretty. Which is why in verse 18, he's saying, the greater my wisdom, the more that I experienced, the more grief I found. And, and the more that I chased, the more I found myself wanting. I don't know where you're at today with your walk, right? And, and I, I'm not trying to make each and every one of these daily bread sessions just about checking your walk, but I think we should all do that on a weekly basis, right, of, of what is defining you really. There's some great wisdom in this book of Ecclesiastes, and that wraps up chapter one for today. And, and I really want you to take a self-examination, if you would, and just ask yourself, what are you chasing after right now? Like, what's the wind in your life that you're chasing after like a crazy person, if we're honest, right? Knowing that you're never really gonna grasp it, and the more that you try, the sadder you are. 
or the more angry it makes you. Some of you may find yourself on this slippery slope right now, and you've been walking it, and you feel it, you get it, um, but uh, maybe through walking through this book, it may bring a different light to that, may bring a different understanding to that. And so, guys, I know this has been about 20 minutes today. Um, typically won't be this long. I wanted to introduce the book a little bit, but thank you for being with me today if you chose to do that. Appreciate you. I love you. I miss you. And I'll see you guys tomorrow for chapter two. Love you guys. Thanks for joining The Daily Bread. By the way, these are my beautiful drawings. Um, they were not drawn by my kids. Um, maybe the letters look a little bit sloppy. That was on purpose. But check out this Jesus. That's pretty good. Anyway, love you guys. Talk to you later.